FEF might be wrapping up for the for the night. Just too many crashes, like the momentum just kind of threw everything off. So before we close out, though, uh, there was a guy that made a tweet regarding re- the correctness of special and general relativity that I was going to go over during the show, but uh, it looks like looks like the show has ended. So before I wrap up the stream here, I'm I'll just go- going to bang that out. Yes, yes, that's the one. I was gonna say that's that was the one for Misfits, right? Yes. Yeah. Run through this relativity thing real quick and close it out. Close out the stream. All right, so we got this. Or I'm streaming on the on Discord if you want to tune in to follow along. So we got this guy on Twitter, Z A three nine three, who asks, who states, um, let's see. So this is why individuals need to treat this guy with a bucket of salt. Yes, Einstein's theory has have been proven through various experiments and observations. And then he gives his list of observations and experiments that uh, prove the correctness of these theories, right? So for special relativity, he cites the equation E equals mc squared, which is part of Einstein's theory of special relativity, expresses the equivalence of mass and energy. This equation has been validated through numerous experiments particularly in nuclear uh, reaction where the large conversions of you do that. No, right. You know, when I saw this movie, I was like, my man, my freaking guy. And then citation here, dude, I like that. He included the sources, like shout out to this dude. That's epic. So we got, we got your boy, the Britannica encyclopedia here. So we'll be hitting that up here in a second. <laughs> dude, I, right. So good for you. Buddy. Hey, Hey, Boy, hey dude, yeah, I, shit. it's better than fucking emptiness. Right. <laughs> I guess so. True. True. We can go. I guess we can do all the legwork. Hey, we'll hit him with the legwork. I was just gonna say, just wait. Yeah. So we got our boy General Relativity here for point number two. So this is Einstein's expansion pack to the first theory. Uh, So Einstein's theory of general relativity is also been extensively tested. Very nice. This is almost as if it was written by ChatGPT. It's like it's got that air of ChatGPT to it. It's been, a, you know. Anyway, is these it really is it really an expansion. It's more like a uh, like a another canon, right? Uh, I mean, yeah. isn't that part of yeah, it's a, it's an expansion, story, though? Yeah, it's a story expansion. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. like, but it it, it's it, a but it contradicts the other canon. Oh, like, okay, okay. Well, okay. Well, hold on a second. We have to break this down then. Yeah. Because it is kind of, hmm. It's you like know, new writers, you know, and they don't like, <laughs> they didn't do their research. You know, they didn't yeah, read the old stuff. It's, it's like Dragon Ball GT versus Dragon Ball Super, yeah. bro. Yeah, yeah uh, that's actually a perfect example. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they, they they didn't watch the first one? Oh, shit. All right. That's hilarious, dude. That's a really good point. Well, we'll keep going. So Sorry, yeah, I don't mean- <laughs> no, you're good. That's hilarious, dude. The the first three tests proposed by Einstein uh, were proposed by himself in 1953. So the perihelion precession of Mercury, right? The bending of light in a, in due to uh, you know in the presence of a gravitational field and the elusive gravitational redshift. These predictions have been confirmed by various experiments. For instance, the bending of starlight was confirmed by astronomer Sir Arthur Eddington during the solar eclipse in May 29, 1919. More recently, the deflect- <laughs> the deflection of gravitational wave the de- I'm sorry, the detection of gravitational waves from a black hole merger by the advanced LIGO team in 2016 <laughs> provided further strong ele- evidence for general relativity. Dude, and then in conclusion, this is how you know Chad GBT. This is how you know Chad GBT wrote this for him, by the way. <laughs> Those are exact Chad GBT references. Too. Like Chad GBT would use literally exact. No, this is, dude, this is 4 0. I know 4 0 when I see dude, it. Dude, I know 4 0 when I see it. But, dude, so the classic, the classic Chad GBT recap. <laughs> That's exactly what he did. And then he posted it like he knew what he was talking about. Posted it like he was on point, bro. He so the little he went and copied it, out the little quotes that Chat GPT gives you, and then he listed about as source, and it was dude. Wikipedia every time. <laughs> or no, the two two words: one Wikipedia, two of Britan Encyclopedia Britannica, one of EarthSky.org, an article, and then another one from it's another article. Looks like 
and then Getty images. Yeah. So not a single paper. He wants us to do the legwork of not, finding all the papers dude, that they're citing. And luckily, this guy posts the question to the internet, and the internet will respond. Like, the legwork has been done, and we will, we, we will uh, go over it in detail. So we've got we've got some observations, some experiments. Go ahead. You're lagging a little bit. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I haven't actually, I didn't actually uh, visit the post, but I'm sure he got blown up. I mean, I know that I touched on it in the Telegram chat, but. Yeah, let's um, let's see yeah. what, what the comments are looking like before we get into it. So we got my boy Eden uh, says lie detector and it's flashing. It's going, it's going all the way in the red. So, and we got, let's see, when when they all, let's see, then why are they all still called theories? Let's see, theory, theory, theory. If it's not true, then they'd be pulled towards the station. Okay, who knows what, okay, I don't know. Reading Twitter timelines is very confusing. So, these might not even be your replies to him. Uh, the relationship between Albert Einstein's work and Henry Punk here is a topic of history. <laughs> Dude, it's literally Chat GPT, bro. Bro, Dude, he just is responding to people by typing in their question to Chat GPT and like literally copy pasting the sources one to one, and then he and then he and then he includes the link. Dude, that's awesome. Dude, what kind of what kind of psychological effect would that have on you doing that? Like, how long can you do that for before you start to really feel bad about it? How many, dude? How many like, times? Would, else called him out for it? I have no we idea. We want to use Chat GPT. We can do that ourselves. We don't. Those are to two straight up Chat GPT. Oh, dude, we got some Lorenz symmetry here. Okay, let's let's read this here. So at least he's paying for at least he's paying for 4.0, and he's not just wasting people's time with the free the free responses. You know, the free responses are the worst, dude. Because <laughs> those are like the broad stroke, really zero nothing. But this one, it like it, it tries to gives you some surface, some like it tries to give you something to latch on to it it tries to mix the encyclopedia britannica with the wikipedia and give it to you in that fashion yeah yeah <laughs> tries to, it's like a it's like a mother bird chewing up a worm and then like vomiting it into your mouth <laughs> so it's pretty much like that so anyway so yeah we'll but, just get yeah, into the Eddington, huh? yeah we'll just get into the to the to these uh fraudulent claims here so we'll start off with e equals mc squared the the old that old famous equation here so this was derived by other people um, prior to 1905, right? So Einstein, 1905, put his, puts his paper in. There was a guy in 1904 who derived a different coefficient for it because that's the thing, right? This relationship of ass, of ass and, and energy, of mass and energy, um, this relationship, right? People were figuring this stuff out with doing actual experiments, right? And not just inserting the mathematics in ad hoc to uh, make it, to make their, uh, theory relevant, right? So we're going to go over a couple of people. So we have um, Hazel Norrell in 1904, who was doing experiments with a closed hollowed sphere, and he was uh, hitting it with radiation energy. And as it was heating up, it would gain mass. It would you know, gain apparent mass. And then when it cooled down, the apparent mass would go away. He came up with the coefficient to express that. That was 4E over 3C squared. So that was his derivation for this relationship that he was measuring with his experiments. And then J.J. Thompson came up with a coefficient for it as well. Um, based off of his experiments with a cathode ray and a cathode tube, right? So these relationships have been established way before, um, way before, rel way before relativity, right? And then we'll get into one more problem with relativity. So the problem with relativistic mass caused, uh, caused problems with how they, you know, define mass. It, it ruined backwards compatibility backwards compatibility with the lab frame so it ruined the covariant relationship with when you do um when you when you're transforming from uh from newtonian physics to uh lorentz you know when you're doing that transformation it's breaking covariance with mass and all that so they and they weren't able to solve the or they won't they weren't able to account for the conservation laws without using uh fallacious mathematics right with the with the pseudo stress tensor and all that that einstein cooked in <clears throat> and this haunted Einstein for 40 years after, you know, so 
during that 40 years after he published his special theory of relativity, he kept trying to properly derive E equals MC squared from this theory because, you know, he says it's an emergent property of relativity and blah, 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 even though it, he doesn't mathematically derive it correctly. It, in his original 1905 paper, this was pointed out by uh, Ives Stowell, who did a review of it and showed that it's that he didn't even mathematically derive it correctly. He just, you know, basically inserts the mathematics and says it's and says it, it says it like it's a fact. But um, he didn't even derive it it, within the framework of special relativity, right? So Einstein's writing here in 1948, you know, this is well after his 1905 paper um, in regards to relativistic mass. And he's he's writing, so he says, he's he's writing to Lincoln uh, Bennett, or Bernard uh, Barnett, in 1902, I'm sorry, 1902, in 19 June 1948, Einstein wrote in German, the letter was typed in English. The highlighted passage says, it is not good to introduce the concept of the mass m equals m divided by one minus v squared over c squared times one half of a moving body for which no clear definition can be given. So this coefficient to represent a mass and energy relationship, he's saying, oh, this is actually dog shit. We should stop doing this. Well, why, Ein? What's going on? It would be better to introduce no other concept, uh, other no other mass concept other than, other than rest mass. And the reason for this is because it has to be covariant with the lab frame. It has to be dynamically covariant. Otherwise, the framework is just nonsense, right? No one's going to accept it. And people that are versed in the mathematics would be able to you know, identify this problem. Um, so Einstein was trying to get ahead of it and correct it. And, you know, he just he ended up not having to uh, worry about it because it turns out that no one really cared. But uh, anyway, so he says here instead yeah. of inter- yeah, oh, sorry. good. Go ahead. He says instead of question, it- yeah. you're done. Yep. He says in- instead of introducing m, it is better to mention the expression for mo- for that um, of momentum of the energy of the body in motion. So here he's trying to separate mass and momentum so that he can properly derive the um, or properly account for the conservation laws in his theory that um, that actually uh, ruined dynamic covariance with the lab frame. What was your question, Toby? Well, so if he never, if you're telling me that he never meaningfully derived it, um, do you think that that might have something to do with the nuclear engineer canceling on coming to uh, Ether Cosmology to talk with us about E equals MC squared's relevance in his work at the nuclear facility? Dude, I'm so glad you brought that up because that's actually what I was going to, uh, what I was looking for. Oh, yeah, here it is. So with, with uh, how Chat GPT had uh, hooked uh, hooked that dude up with that citation for nuclear reactions, right? We actually had an an interview lined up with a nuclear physicist to um to go over this stuff, right? And he ended up canceling. He never n- never followed through. Um, but he did. Uh, Toby, is it safe to say that he watched the work before he uh before he came on? Yeah, it would be a pretty <laughs> safe. Uh, I, I yeah, he was definitely sent some videos. Yeah, there was an emergency nuclear, uh, what do you call it, emergency, right, that he had to attend to. So he wasn't able to obtain the interview and describe this relation, this uh, this mythological relationship that exists between a nuclear reactor and Einstein's equations. So we have a citation here from, actually, this is Ohanian. Where is the nuclear reactor guy? Ah, here we go. Yeah. So this is from um, Thomas D. Uh, 2004, Secrets of the Ether. This is a book that he wrote. So this is a citation that he's providing in his book. So he says, conservation factor for E equals MC squares. We often refer we often refer to nuclear reactions on the sun, nuclear power plants, and nuclear bombs as an example of mass to energy conversion. In the nuclear power plants in the United States, uh, in the nuclear power plants the United States has been operating for 60 years, a high degree of precision applies to the measurements uh, a measured amount of energy and material mass per- passed through the reactor. And yet there is not one report available where this, where anywhere that this writer was able to obtain that presents data from a nuclear power plant that shows that mass uh, that the mass of the fuel was exactly converted to um, energy according to e equals mc squared. One would think that this would be proof of special relativity and the data from the precisely monitored nuclear power plant 
would provide an abundance of evidence. Nonetheless, such data apparently does not exist. And then he goes on to further say here, in fact, there is evidence to suggest that more energy comes out of a nuclear power plant than the mass of the fuel that goes in. And then he cites a liquid fast metal breeder reactor once operated for 25 years and produced a fuel and produced more, more fuel and its byproducts than it consumed during its operations. And then that's a violation of the conservation laws, right? And then the citation given here is the EBR and the definition, blah, blah, blah. When it's cooled, the molten levels, you know, basically this reactor here that he cited, um, you know, they were talking about this abundance of energy or whatever, right? So I went to look for this exact citation. I couldn't find any exact uh, verbiage where they were like, yeah, we definitely like, you know, (laughs) Uh, defeated the conservation laws or anything like that but this is what he's uh putting forward but definitely in relation to um you know this isn't a substantiated claim right this is just the mythology that we're told this is just something that a an internet chat bot recites to us right so i think that's bro. i think that's pretty sufficient for e equals mc squared was there anything else bro did you just oh eddington just... experiment Oh yeah, 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 yeah. We'll get to that in a second. What was that, Pizza? Did, did you did you just say that they produced more byproducts than they the, put in? That's what that guy said, but I couldn't find anything to substantiate that. Okay, because I'm like, yeah, no, obviously, know. obviously that would be insane, but yeah, I couldn't couldn't substantiate it. I mean, I mean, I wouldn't be willing to believe that they violated the law, but I'd be willing to believe that they found a way to like you know, pull it from somewhere unconventional. Mm. Yeah. All right. I mean, something maybe to touch on would be the contradiction between the approach of light speed and the everything becoming null, but also exponentially increasing in mass, which just doesn't even make any sense at all. Like as you approach light speed, your um, your length becomes nothing, but your mass increases exponentially. <laughs> Did you and, just and, you just become an inverted black hole? Yeah, it's 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 not meant to make any sense. It's just meant to break your mind. And they call and the, and then they'll and then they'll this is so this is how they'll dress it up too. They'll say like they'll call it a paradox, and then they'll be like, oh, that's just a fun little paradox. That's a consequence of relativity. And it's like what? Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? You're like your your theory con- like has co- that contradicts itself that causes paradoxes, and you're you dress it, you're putting a bow on it, and you're trying to present it to me as if this is proof of your theory that your thought experiment makes no sense. And they're like, yeah, totally. Yes, they're frothing at the mouth and shit. It's, it's insane. <laughs> Alan, do you just have like a a slideshow already prepared for every single one of these questions? Yes. They keep getting better and better too. So wow, bro. this wow. is a well, this is a presentation I did over a year ago now, um, where I went through all the proofs of general relativity that they give on Wikipedia. So if you go to Wikipedia, you'll have like a list of shit. So it starts with perihelion precession, gravitational fields, redshift, and all that. And I just went through them all and just knocked them all out. So that if anyone ever brought them up again, I could just pull up this and go directly to it and we could walk through the whole narrative brilliant i mean yeah i was just gonna say it helps that they are just totally reiterative and the same exact thing that we keep debunking yep yeah because if you go to wait oh, that's not it uh relativity wiki so if you go to relativity theory wikipedia and you type in general yeah and you see the experimental proofs for general It'll give you all that stuff that that guy just listed, basically. Oh, where? Wait, where is it? Hold on. Anyway, it's on Wikipedia. It's you pull down, pull down the list. It's it's all this. It's all this stuff right here. And there's a couple other things, but then it like has like the specific experiments, like Eddington, Con Repka, etc. So I went and dug through all of those to you know see if there was any relativity in there. Turns out there wasn't. So. We'll start with the perihelion precession. So this is actually a calculative post-calculation, post-diction, um, you know, part of relativity. This isn't actually proof of anything. This is just where they took the mathematics coordinate system and conformed it to meet the observation. But this is kind of like the uh, the entry level 
for getting the theory out there, right? So this is like, so this isn't like meaningful in a physical, meaningful sense to like, like just like, oh, we applied this math to the sky, therefore relativity theory. That's not it. This is like, um, this would be like part one of of applying that, or of like getting people to believe in relativity theory, right? So it's like, can you even, can you even uh, conform your coordinate system to the observations? And he's like, well, yes, I can. So. For those of you who don't know the perihelion, this is what it would look like. So if you took 100 years of the of Mercury going orbiting around the sun, uh, and you you split the sun in half at the equator, at its equator, right? And you say, like, okay, if you look at Mercury here, you'll see it's just above the equator by, like, one pixel, right? So they're saying that over the course of 100 years, there's a slight shift, and Mercury will be two pixels above uh, the, the equator, um, over the course of a hundred years. Right. And they're like, Oh my God, how do we explain this? We need to figure this out. Newton can't explain it. We added up all the gravitational influence of all the planets. And we're, we have a tug of war with, uh, Mercury, the sun and all the other planets. And they're, uh, you know, they're playing celestial tug of war and we're, we're off on our prediction of the amount of uh, precession by 43 arc seconds or something like that. Right. And then Einstein comes along and he's like, no worries, boys, I got you. Uh, we'll take the mass of the sun and we'll say that Mercury doesn't weigh anything and we'll bend space time um, around that. And we'll use, um, we'll use that bending of space time to say that Mercury is traveling along a geodesic path and that curvature will explain that missing 43 arc seconds. And what do you know, his, his, uh, his theory came out mathematically sound. So that's really cool. But that was, um, I believe that was before he got into the differential calculus and all that. So in one of the iterations that he tried to use to explain uh, this observation, right, he used, he, <clears throat> he completely co-opted a guy named Paul Gerber's um, mathematical formula or mathematical derivation for the perihelion precession using Newtonian dynamics in an ether, where basically he was setting the speed of, he was setting the propagation rate of a gravity of a gravity wave to the speed of light. And he was saying that like, if light is propagating, um, through, you know, if, if the gravitational wave, uh, propagates through light essentially. So it like, so they travel at the same speed. That's kind of how he did his theory. So we'll go over the equation here. So we look at Gerber's equation. We got 24 pi cubed a, a squared divided by T squared. Right. So like the, the main important thing here of this equation is T squared. And c squared. So the relationship here is that he's setting the propagation speed limit to the speed of light, and he, then that's how he's doing it, right? So he's explaining the mechanism um, for the shift, for the perihelion shift. So he's saying that the the sun is emitting gravity waves, right, and they're propagating at c, and that time delay there is affecting, um, like that 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 delay is the reason that there's a is the reason that there's a precession, right? So that was his mechanism and mathematical derivation for it. So this is the final form of the equation. There, there's obviously uh, more to it, right, um, on the back end. And then Einstein came along. Oh, dude, no way. Same exact equation with, with a capital T. Well, what did Einstein do with his capital T uh, instead of using the little t, right? So with the capital T in Einstein's theory, space and time contract um, in the presence of gravity, right? Or, yeah, in the presence of a gravitational field, right? So... He takes he just changes this to the the period of the event like Mercury's orbital period how long it takes for it to complete a revolution and then he just contracts that that's it so all he had to do to get the missing forty three arc seconds exact is just provide that using his framework and just completely co opted uh, Paul Levu I'm sorry Paul Gerber's work and when he got called out on it he said hey man like this is his excuse he says listen. Uh, I never seen this equation before in my life. Um, and if, and if I, if I were to, um, it doesn't matter even if I did, because Paul's answer was wrong and, and his, his mechanism was wrong. Right. And my mechanism is right. Cause Paul was trying to use like an ether mechanism to set the, the speed of light. Right. Like the, so he, he was just saying like, he literally took this whole entire framework and just changed one thing about it. And then use that as his uh, as proof, right? So obviously that's not proof of anything. That's a post diction, a post diction calculation. So then we're going to move on to gravitational redshift. So this is supposed to be one of the this is like the crowning jewel of relative of general relativity theory because this is what gives the physical interaction between the calculations of like that that abstract concept of space time curvature in a gravitational field. 
So this experiment, they were looking for starlight to be displaced due to the presence of a gravitational field. So they were saying that the photon would be traveling in a geodesic path. It'd be traveling in a straight line, but it's going to get blocked by the sun during an eclipse, right? But due to the gravitational influence of the sun, we're actually going to see that photon travel, or it's going to curve. It's going to bend around the sun, or we're going to see it um, when we shouldn't, right? So that was that was the that was the um, that was the proposition there. And there was two predictions given for the Newtonian, and, or I'm sorry, one there was a prediction given for the for the Newtonian and one given for Einstein. So the Newtonian prediction was, let me see if I can pull it up real quick. Yeah, okay, so Newton thought that the sun's gravity would act on light as if it were like a tiny corpuscle that had mass, and he thought that it would like attract it in like a mass attracting max, ma, uh, mass attracting mass situation. So his prediction was that the starlight would be displaced by 1.87 or oops, 0.87 arc seconds. And then Einstein's prediction was that it would be displaced by 1.75 arc seconds and it would be an inversely proportional relationship to the to the dis, to the distance. So it would be further out you would get more displacement and then closer in you would get less displacement. Right? So these so huge distinction here with with the predictions, right? Because what was actually, so we're told that Eddington did his thing and he went there, did his observations. We don't have to get into the whole history of it. But basically, um, the other guy, Cromlin, that was in Brazil, they say that his observations don't count. All 16 of his photographic plates are null due to a temperature differential during the eclipse. Um, there was link, there was physical length contraction do, um, in his apparatus due to the temperature changing. So all of his photographs are null. Can't use a single one of them, right? But Eddington, he who took 16 photographs, all but two of those photographic plates were destroyed or, you know, not usable due to uh, the same situation in um, just weather and stuff like that. Right. So he's got two two photographic plates that give not not a very good um, reading, but he has to get back to England to get further to do a further analysis on it. So he gets back to England, him and the homie uh, Frank Dyson Watson. I think this is where's Dyson at? Anyway, he's in here somewhere. Him and Frank Dyson Watson um, go to work on the on the uh, on the photographic plates, and they mathematically derive through statistical corrections and probability and whatnot that um, that the displacement was actually in good agreement with Einstein, and everything was good to go. And keep in mind, they had to <laughs> they couldn't even use the, the the reference plates that they took. They had to use different plates that were taken a year prior. So, like there was an there was an actual different material used for the comparison too. Um, so they had to come up with like, you know, a give and take for how, you know, for how much was going to be lost during that transformation. And they, they came out on the other end of it, that it was a successful prediction for Einstein. And, uh, so they, so they got together on November 7th, the Royal Society and the Royal Astronomical Society and Eddington and the boys, uh, uh, Joseph Thompson from, from earlier, right. We remember JJ Thompson, uh, Alfred Howler, you know, all the, all the, uh, all the boys got together to discuss this observation. And they basically came out and said that it gave good agreement with Einstein and they were going to roll through and do the gravitational, uh, they, they were going to proceed forward, um, with Einstein's theory being the, you know, superseding Newton, you know, this was going to be like the new jam, right? So there was a couple objections that were raised here. And one of the, one of the big and important, big and important, big important ones was from this guy here, Dr. Silverstein who this is a quite a lot of text here, but I'll just kind of get to the main points. He points out that during the eclipse, there was observations for gravitational redshift that were supposed to be made by two gentlemen, St. John's and John Evershades. Um, and these guys were looking at the, st at the same starlight that Eddington was, you know, photographing and they were looking for gravitational redshift um, that was to be in accordance with Einstein's theory, right? Cause remember part of the other proof was, that the that the spectral that there was going to be a spectral shift in light due to the interaction with the gravitational field, meaning that as light is passing through this curvature of space time, right, it's traveling on this geodesic, it's going to rub up against the gravitational field, and the wavelengths are going to stretch or compress in proportion to that gravitational field, in its direction of travel, and it's going to cause a redshift effect to it, right? And using Einstein's equations, you can 
break down what that frequency will be, right? So they've got they've got some homies out in the cut splitting light beams from starlight looking for a redshift, right? In accordance with Einstein's theory. So we're gonna we'll come back to these guys here in a second. So they uh they didn't get any Actually, we'll just continue on with them now. They didn't get any observations to correspond to the redshift that would be needed to to substantiate the claim that I that um, that there was a displacement of starlight, and it was due to the um, due to the mechanism of the gravitational field, right? So without that displacement, if there, it, I'm sorry, without that redshift reading to to back up the the observation that Eddington took. Right where he's just looking through, looking at the starlight with a camera, taking pictures, right to back up any alleged displacement, they would have to have split the light that's coming from those stars, and they would have to find a redshift that corresponds to that. So to kind of show what that looks like here, you would have a telescope, you would have a light, uh, light coming in from the starlight. It's going to hit a collimator, so it gets nice and focused. Then they're going to hit that. It's going to hit a um a prism. And then that's going to hit a camera or detector, right? And, but that's in the modern times. In the old times, they just had a photographic plate. So in the photographic plate, they're going to have this, and they're going to reference the the colors from that, right? So that's how they're going to take their their redshift readings, and they're looking for a specific shade of red that corresponds to Einstein's theory, right? And these gentlemen didn't get that observation. So if there was any starlight displaced, they couldn't factually say, "Oh, this was due to." Uh, you know, the gravitational field, which is predicted by, you know, described by Einstein's theories, right? So this is a huge contradiction to any sort of displacement, if there is any, right? So he goes on to say here, as I have pointed out on other occasions, if there is no spectral shift, right, if there's no interaction between that gravitational field and light, then Einstein's uh, coefficients that describe space-time um, and the curvature of it, which are entirely responsible for the redshift, must go to zero and blah, 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 right? And basically what he's saying here, is that if there's no gravitational redshift in these observations, then you can't say that space-time is curving and things are going around geodesics due to the curvature caused by a gravitational field. And in all orbits in your model using um, gravi- you know, curvature of space-time, if it's not curved, then all the orbits in your model would just be straight lines going towards a celestial body, and it and it wouldn't matter about any gravitational influence. Like like so, basically, what he's saying is without this redshift being substantiated by these two gentlemen. Uh, they can't describe, they can't, they can't say space time curvature is like a real thing, right? They can't provide physical, they can't say it's a physical mechanism that, that changed the frequency of light in correspondence to the strength of the gravitational field uh, and the curvature of space time that it was traveling along, right? So he points that out and Eddington's like, Hey man, don't be a party pooper. Um, we saw the displacement. Um, let's not, let's not focus too much on the, on the, uh, on the frequency exchange, right? On the medium exchange, right? So there's a couple of problems with this observation. If you, if you give, if you give them, if you give the displacement, if you're like, okay, maybe there was displacement. Um, there's a, there's a problem with that because the displacement and where it was observed, remember it was an inversely proportional, um, distance prediction, right? And double the amount of Newton's in terms of uh, arc seconds, in terms of, in terms, of, in terms of how far the light would be displaced. So we have H. Von Kubler here who says, it should be noted that the deflection predicted by Einstein's 19 and by Einstein in 1916 was very small being 1.7 arc seconds of a lay of right at the edge of the sun and inversely proportional to the radial distance to the center of the sun. Since, since no stars for which the measurements were made during 1919 eclipse were within two solar radii of the center, the largest deflection that would have occurred according to the theory would have been less than 0.8 seconds of arc, which for the 343 centimeter focal length of the telescope used by Eddington would have corresponded to about 0.01 millimeters or 0.000933 or 3930. Ah, never mind, not going to finish it out, but you guys get it. Really small amount of inches on the photographic plate, right? So, um, the distances that where they say where where there was actual displacement, it turns out they they say it only occurred within the solar limb. So if you look at the sun, um, and you and you break down like the solar limb would be like the very edge right before it gets to the blackness of space. So in this area, there's suspected to be you know an electric field, magnetic field, plasma, all sorts of things, intense pressure, right? So th- they couldn't. 
they they couldn't say, oh yeah, this was definitely due to space time curvature, right? Because there's the, it's 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 even in their paradigm, it's within an area where there's already multiple media to cause the shift, right? They looked during an eclipse so that it wasn't as bright. Um. So yeah, that's that's uh the, so that's gravitational redshift, right? And other people have repeated this experiment, you know, um, when there's eclipses that will line up with stars and all that. And they get no, um, they get, they, they don't get anything better than what Eddington and Cromlin got. So they get inconsistent readings and keep in mind, they're only, um, the only stuff that they do find seems to only occur within the solar limb. And that's, you know, obvious and that's disputed. Right. And it doesn't even give, and at the solar limb, that distance doesn't even give an Einsteinian prediction. Right. So if anyone's like, oh, yeah, space time curvature Eddington, it's like, hey, how far were those stars when uh, the Eddington observed were they displaced? Oh, they were just they were, they were displaced at the solar solar limb. Oh, well, you know, it was a uh, inversely proportional distance prediction. Right. So it couldn't be it wouldn't be possible at that distance for it to be displaced by one point seven seconds, one point seven, five seconds of arc. And that's it. That's a wrap. You know, so that's gravitational redshift that never um existed or lensing that may or may not have existed right so the only further lensing we get is stuff from like the james webb james webb telescope where they're like oh look when we look back in time gravitational lensing james webb telescope oh look when we look back in time we see these gravitational lensing oh come on you're gonna make me load up the image come on all right so they they show nobody to be clear nobody's put their eye through a telescope and seen light bending like this or doing anything like this right and the predictions that they made for the eclipse and subsequent predictions of eclipses nothing like this at all it's a minuscule minuscule tiny amount at the solar limb so you know and depending on which belief system um you have the sun may or may not have media uh, mediums there already to uh, facilitate that energy exchange, right? Well, they wouldn't be using some kind of a uh, filtration, some kind of computational filtration on their data from the from outer space for all of their image or imagery, right? Uh, they probably would, yeah, 100%. <laughs> no, they wouldn't fit it to perfectly match general relativity predictions. Listen, they would never never make then, bold predictions and then show you images later with technology to supplement their claims th by showing you things that you could never see yourself that match the predictions that they made earlier. Y'all are a bunch of conspiracy theorists. Of course not. <laughs> Dude, all right. Not. So we hit them all. And this is, so this is detrimental here because these two predictions here, um, the perihelion precession and the bending of light, um, are not substantial enough to give substance to the bending of space time to actually say that that's the mechanism that did it. The gravitational redshift here would be the, especially in tandem with the displacement. I mean, these two would complement each other nicely or it would be hard to argue, um, you know, that, that space time wasn't the cause of this, right? So when you get into this, um, these don't exist and they're, you know, they had, they had um, equipment well enough to measure it right and they didn't get any measurements and then that the St. John's and Evershade guy actually found that they could make observations throughout the year using uh, Venus transits and they wouldn't have to rely on eclipses you know in periodic events over the course of multiple years to wait right they could just do it throughout the year in their um uh at their uh you know at their convenience really and they did that and guess what not a single gravi not a single rev not a single redshift was gravitated by Einstein. And this was such a problem that Eddington actually wrote to a Swiss mathematician named Herman Well, I think it was. And he said, Hey man, St. John's and Evershades are um are being real downers here with this gravitational redshift situation. And they're kind of pointing out the fact that we don't have a mechanism to even you know, to even uh, explain this to anyone, any displacement of light, if there is any. So like, can you help us out with your theory? You know, so Eddington was well aware of all of this and knew. So when he sat there and told, um, Silverstein at that meeting, like, Hey man, 
Like we got our measurements. Let's not get crazy. He knew, he knew the validity of Silverstein's um, objections because he wrote to that Swiss guy six months before he even did the Eddington observations. Right. So that was six months before. So this gravitational redshift problem was a consistent problem um, for the theory. Right. Like they were trying to get, they were trying to get this mechanism in and they couldn't do it. So that's a uh, gravitational redshift. And I think we can close out on LIGO. So Toby, do you want to, do you want to just uh, send LIGO to the grave with the corrections that they make that, that back up Miller and what they throw away to just end it? Oh, sure. Yeah. So before they, we even get to LIGO, let's just talk about in 2017, because LIGO is literally, it's, they use what's called a convolutional neural network. So before we get even talk about that, let's talk about this, the, just the error weighted uh, least squares regression model that they use to look at the, uh, the resonance differences in 2017. The, what they used, the, their error weighting, the, uh, the specific model accounted for daily uh, variations in seasonal variance. So those are exactly um, the whole point of what Miller measured was seasonal variance and daily fluctuations also corroborates what Maurice Elias said with his pendulum. So uh, the fact that they washed that out before they even looked at the data and then said, oh, no variance in C in 2017, uh, to me was really revealing. Like why, why would you have to, they had, they had to model, they had to model, statistically model their results to show no variance in C. And then they published a paper saying no variance in C. Um, but so then with LIGO, it gets a step worse because they're not just modeling it out with a uh, regression model or, or in their regression model, because you have to use uh, some level of regression modeling to do, I think, that differential uh, to look at the difference in the, the resonance. But anyways, um, with LIGO, they use what's called a convolutional neural network. And a uh, convolutional neural network has, let me pull up my notes here. Uh, where's this? Oh, in any case, it's like multiple layers. There's, it does pooling. First, well, first it pulls it into the convolutional layer, which abstracts the data across multiple di dimensions. Uh, and then it goes through that and it p picks out shapes from the data. Um, and then it goes through and uh, stretches out those shapes and does more convolutional. Uh, what is it? That it's the ReLU layer next or whatever. Um, but yeah, it goes through a bunch of layers and then it does a bunch of uh, correlation between all those different shapes that it pulled out. And then it, uh, it it combines them in different ways. And then it does more. Uh, it does what's called matched filtering. So it goes through and throws out a bunch of the noise. Oh, the data, by the way, the data that they receive at LIGO from his is noise, right? Is noise. It's called noise. And their sample data, the first time that they found a gravitational wave, um, and everyone got really excited, the sample data that they, or what they thought they had found was actually sample data noise. Um, somehow, all the engineers there got fooled into thinking that there was a gravitational wave, but it was just sample data. I guess they were just trying to make sure that the engineers were thinking. I'm starting to wonder at this point if maybe they just got caught that they planted a gravitational wave. But in any Brilliant. case, in any case, uh, they did measure supposedly something during a cosmological event. Um, and I don't. I actually think that that's that's likely, and I would have expect something like that kind of with our etheric model. Um, and they, they measure it uh, at two different laser interferometer labs. But the important thing to realize is just that they're running it through a neural network to match whatever predictions they want to uh, to reify. And they do that through, um, yeah, like they don't look at the data. They're not looking at real fringes or something. They're, they're taking what's called noise, and then they're running it through, uh, like, literally a bunch of supercomputers. So I don't know how you can derive anything meaningful about reality from that yeah you actually can't and uh that's uh that's why they 
So that's why every year they like go on a press release and they're like, they try to remind everyone, Oh, Hey, we detected another gravitational wave. Cause it's like this point, they just kind of have to like satisfy the status quo of it. Cause it doesn't actually mean anything. Like no one's lives so, changed. I mean, no one, nothing matters at all in regards to, to that. Those, they, keep, they need to keep those donos coming. They know? do. Well, the second time when they found one, I watched a video of a guy interview. One of the guys that I uh, was there and like, he didn't believe it for like months. And I'm wondering if the guy was just like, oh, they planted another one. Like, he just didn't want to be, he probably felt like a fool for believing the first one. They like, they all went around looking for bugs and stuff around there. Like, they say that they all went looking for like USB drives or like any sign of like a hack or a bug. And uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's weird in my opinion. They straight punked everyone and they try and say, they say like, oh, we did it as a blind test to see if the engineers were thinking. Like, I, like literally on their website, it says it right here. The collaboration knew that the detection could be a possible blind injection, a fake signal added to the data without telling the analyst to de- to test the detector and the analysis. Nonetheless, the collaborator, the collaboration proceeded under the assumption that the, that the signal was real, and wrote an approved scientific paper paper reporting the groundbreaking discovery. A few moments later. <laughs> insert SpongeBob meme <laughs> a few moments later, right? According to plan, it was revealed that the signal was indeed a blind injection. So these scientists have no idea what they're like when they, when they, cause they've got their model, what they think they need. They've got their regressions, their pools, their layers, their, uh, <laughs> you know, how they break the, the, uh, the noise down and how they reassemble it into what they think it should look like. Right. So they've got their preconceived notion, but they have no actual reference in reality. To compare it to so when they get when their alarm goes off they're like oh my god the computer just told us we just detected a ch- uh time changing in the in, in physical reality a ripple of time right so like you know how do you think about how crazy it is what they say that they detected right so <laughs> imagine a ripple going across the earth where like just like one second is just slower than a second before it it's just time is just deleting a little bit, right? That's that's essentially what they say they detected. Just a, a, a little ripple that just went through where time changed, where time was different as the ripple propagated through the, through the earth, you know, and around it or whatever, like through the fabric of the universe. Imperceptible to I us, mean, but to a laser. I mean, <laughs> These people that that are you know making those huge donos and all that, and then the um, and people that got to modify you know documents and texts and you know shit for colleges and universities and just everyday knowledge. I mean, they want they want them to show something. You know what I mean? So if they they've been you know funded by all these people, you know, and they're not showing shit, you know, they got to come up with something. So yeah, it makes sense that they would like kind of fool them. I gotcha, you know, like dude, they have to. Oh, just kidding, just JK, and you know, it just sucks for the people that were like wholeheartedly into it and excited and everything else. But I mean, they have to show something to somebody. No, they have yeah, to. Yeah, but bro. now they're in a catch twenty. Now they're in a catch twenty two of fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, I'm an idiot. Yeah, that's why you don't fucking lie, you know? Yeah, well, look at the diminishing return on this, right? Like, now nobody gives a shit. They can make all the announcements they want about gravity waves and black holes. Nobody cares. Now they're just a meme. Yeah. And this was right off of the back, to, or back to the um, the one that detected in 2015 and then published in 2016. Um, that was right off of the back of them saying, um, I don't know if you guys remember this, but there was a paper that came out where, the, where these scientists said that they could detect what happened um, 14 billion m- nanoseconds um, after the Big Bang. They were like, they, they were like, yeah, we were pretty close to knowing what happened, you know, uh, right, you know, before the Big Bang or whatever, or some shit like that. And they said that, like, <laughs> that they have time down to a factor of like, you know, billions of a second after the Big Bang, and it's and it's like that turned out to be unsubstantiated dog shit that they, you know, threw under the bus. So it's like everybody was already kind of like skeptical of these, you know, insane claims where they're just like, oh yeah, we can, yeah, Big Bang, you know, we got that shit down to the billions yeah, the of a second. period or whatever. The reheating period or whatever it's called. Yeah, yeah, it was something where they were like, we know that this happened fractions of a second after the Big Bang and like the fractions of a second were down to yeah. like 
the micro billionth of a second. And like, yeah, it was some heat. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. And they, uh, and they totally shit the bet on it. I'm uns- uns- uh, unsubstantiated, had to walk it back. And, uh, and then they came out I mean, with this, bl- with this honest, blind injection. I think, I think to be honest, I think they're, um, like in reality, they're going to have to be piping that shit up a lot more here pretty soon because like people are like us are figuring the shit out and it's not like so much a fringe kind of thing anymore you know i think there's more and more people that are wisening up just by fucking taking a look outside and seeing what's going on versus what's being told and what's being like you know erased and stuff like that so i i I wouldn't doubt if it just like gets really hot here pretty soon with all these extra bullshit you know uh, claims like that i mean i think i just saw one too that was like um they kind of refuted the whole carbon dating processes and uh, debunking all that recently well, like, it turns out. I'm oh, sorry. I thought you were done. Go ahead. No, I'm done. I'm done. It turns out that when you go, when you go through an input layer, where the data is given a matrix of pixel values, and then you go into a convolutional layer where you everything is uh, extrapolated across multiple dimensions, and uh, you use. Uh, kernels that slide across for uh, different map possibilities and then you go from there into an activation layer aka the relu layer shout out to the relu layer and then you use an element wise activation function uh, so you can look for rectified linear activation and that allows you to add uh, some non-linearity to the system and that allows the network to learn more complex patterns uh, within your uh, your data and then you go from there into your pooling layer, and that allows you to take all that, all that convolution that you did, the convolutional, uh, you know, extrapolations that you did. You, you from when you get into the pooling layer, you allow to, you can reduce the dimensions. So anything that's a little bit, you know, makes things a little too big in that area, or a little too, you know, stretched out here or there, and you can just reduce that down in the pooling layer. Um, and then after the pooling, or you, yeah, you reduce spatial dimension, dimension dimensionality. And then you go into the fully connected layer where everything is uh, has connections to activations in the previous layer. So you can take patterns from the previous layer and try to apply them across, you know, one, a pattern from, uh, from one set of data. You can try to apply that pattern to other parts of the data uh, from the other layer. And then, you know, they can learn from that, and the different different features can then be used to contribute to the next layer, the output layer, where you do all your classes, all your classification. Uh, so that's all, you know, more quote-unquote neurons are there to use uh, class predictions. So they're doing not just classification, but predictions of the classifications. Um, and then you can use uh, what's called, I guess, softmax activation, and uh, that will help you have a output probability distribution over the classes. And then after that, you can go through normalization. And then normalization, uh, that just basically allows you to throw out a lot of the, a lot more noise, quote unquote. And then after you throw out a lot more noise, you can then look at your data your, you know, with, with an actual computer. And uh, yeah, there you go. And then, then you have the architecture of a, uh, of a gravity wave in there if, you, if you're lucky. If you're lucky, you might find a gravity wave and all that. I, I thought you were like uh, doing cooking instructions for like a reeducation souffle. 